All right, hello everybody. We'll get started. My name is Vic Vucic. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer at Digital Promise. Thank you all for joining us, especially at the last session standing between uh, you and happy hour. Uh, but I promise you, it will be well worth your time and effort. Um, we have an incredible panel up here that I'm really excited about. Uh, I spend a lot of time around the country uh, seeing innovative, uh, innovative education, leveraging technology in so many ways. And you know, we often talk a lot about AI or these various things or um, you know, adaptive technologies and this and that. But when it comes to really just amazing learning, that integrates technology with equity at the center. We have pretty much best of class up here of people that are working on that, that have done that, and know how to make that happen. And in amazing, you know, in challenging environments, and uh, and really empowering learners to uh, to really, I would say, amplify their voice, feel a strong sense of becoming a strong learner that really changes their lives. Um, so I'm just going to kick up, kick off, and frame real quick. Uh, but let's just go down and introduce. You guys can each introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Darren Brawley. I am superintendent with Compton Unified School District. I've been there for about 10 years, and we are really focused on eliminating the opportunity gap for children of color by exposing them to everything in the area of technology that we can so that they can later on globally compete. I'm Sean McCusker. I'm the Director of Professional Learning for Digital Promise, specifically with the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools Program. Uh, we work for digital equity in some underserved and underfunded communities around the country, and I'm the author of the upcoming book, Becoming Active Citizens, on redefining civic education in America. My name is David Miyashiro, Superintendent for Cajon Valley Union School District, about 15 minutes east of here. My boss and board president, Tam Rotero, is sitting right there. And we have over 50 languages spoken, beautifully diverse community, and our vision is happy kids and healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. Hi, I'm Kyla Hamovitz, the Director of Education Technology at Digital Promise, working with the Learner Variability Project. Uh, and I'm Quentin Cook, I'm CEO of Remind, uh, which is the largest communication platform for educators. Uh, we're focused on building relationships between educators, students, and families. Excellent, thank you so much. So really just to set things up, what is powerful learning? Powerful learning is really a concept that uh, we established at Digital Promise a number of years ago. When technology started playing a bigger role in supporting learning, what we saw was, many of you are familiar with kind of the digital divide, right? Where do kids have access to computers and internet? But then we saw that there was actually a second gap happening, um, and research was really showing this, that even when there is access to technology and, um, and internet, that often when you go to underserved communities, kids will be using it you know, often with headphones and just doing multiple choice questions for two hours on steroids, very you know, isolated. And then you go to places that have more, and they're doing maker, they're learning to code, they're launching businesses, they're doing incredible things that amplify their voice. And so it's really trying to capture that there's not an, another gap that we have to solve and that when we roll out technology, we really leverage it to empower learners, give them agency, help them collaborate, respect their culture, their background, help them plug into their communities and solve real, real world problems. Because that's the transformation that actually really has to happen if we want to change the results of our education system overall. So given that, Darren, Compton, you've really done some incredible leveraging of powerful technology for powerful learning. Can you talk to us a little bit about examples of that, plus kind of through the whole pandemic, what you've seen is the core of success there, and especially you guys do it with equity at the really, really the heart of it. Yeah, so as I stated earlier, um, we're really focused on eliminating that opportunity gap for students of color in the area of technology. And we've done a great job with partnering with various uh, agencies and, and companies. Uh, Verizon Innovative Learning is, is one of those, as well as the Heartland of America and ASU. And through them, we have uh, several of Verizon Innovative Learning Schools and labs, where we have one-to-one uh, -one, uh, iPads, uh, computer labs, and various experiences that students are able to, to take advantage of. In that, we have some pr pivotal practices that we've established over time. Um, throughout the pandemic, it was very important for us to really have uh, top-tiered professional development in place, which, which we did. 
uh, online distance learning uh, platform for resources that teachers could pull from. And uh, we had virtual walkthroughs that we actually um, implemented with the administrators being able to walk through the classroom uh, virtually. One of the things that we're, we're proud about is the immersive media track that we have, and that's a curriculum that is taught through the Verizon Labs. And it allows our students to participate in, to participate in augmented uh, virtual reality, as well as uh, um, empowers them to uh, take over their own learning, where they participate in digital storytelling and things like that. Um, they participate by uh, using virtual reality headsets, um, implementing Oculus Go, 360 cameras, Samsung phones, uh, A51 phones, um, and a host of uh, so many other different educational platforms. Uh, through the process, our students also participated in Minecraft Challenge, and that was pretty interesting because students actually designed and were able to uh, build uh, spaces uh, for for living and to explore things uh, firsthand uh, based upon those experiences, uh, choosing different habitats, workplaces, et cetera, and, and things that impact, actually impact the public. Um, robots, you know, robotics, coding, um, you name it, all of that is in place. Um, spheros to simulate um, life on other planets. Um, our students actually uh, participate in in, in, in a uh, project where they use drones to test the uh, prototype, different prototypes of drones to test the uh, Mars surface, if you will, and experience what that might be in addition to uh, creating Mars rovers uh, to explore the planets. So a lot of different uh, activities that they participate in. And they also participate in student-led teaching. I mean, our students are actually teaching the teachers how to teach. <laughs> many of these things, believe it or not, and they're also, you know, they're training other teachers, they're, they're training other students in terms of how to use the technology that's in place. Um, and we also have a robust uh, interaction with outside, outside agencies, you know, whether it's SpaceX or, or Boeing, you know, Project Wingspan with, with Boeing, um, uh, education, excuse me, uh, education, is, education, engineering week with, with SpaceX, where, where the folks from the companies actually come in and work with our students. And students participate in a, in a host of different activities around coding and, and app challenges as well. Wow, that's fantastic. It's a lot, and I think uh, incredible opportunities for the learners. And I think it really touches on a key kind of paradigm shift in powerful learning is shifting from learners just consuming, consuming content, to actually creating and engaging and breaking down barriers with the community in those ways. And when you see that happen, it really sort of breaks the mold to where even the, the learners are even teaching the teachers, right? It's incredible. Um, so Sean, Verizon Innovative Learning Schools rolls out one-to-one -one in over 500 schools across the country with full professional learning and everything. What have you learned through that? What's the key to success? And what's been really critical to put both equity at the center and do this through the pandemic? Right. I, I think that in the beginning, when you're working with schools that have been underfunded or underserved in terms of technology, getting the technology out is the point, right? Like, once they have the technology, people are so excited that sometimes they don't think beyond that threshold, right? So we, we roll out devices and people are super excited and then they don't see the change that they thought they were going to see. So in our Verizon Innovative Learning Program, we have six elements of success, which is our research-based uh, procedure, like, our, our, our system for how to be successful in schools. Uh, key things is a leadership team that has a clear sense of vision and a professional learning plan that is precise, like know exactly what you want. Like you can't think of educational technology, you can't think of the skills that students need like candy at a parade, we're just gonna whip it all around and hope everybody gets a piece, right? Like you need something that's more meaningful than that. And so what we've seen is that if you have a really inten a, like intentionality about how you're directing your leaders to instruct the use of technology, if you have an intentionality about how you want teachers to have their students employing this technology, right, and if you have a clear mission and plan that is conveyed to everybody, and that's not just the teachers and the students and the staff, that's like the community as well. 
Because one of the barriers we see in uh, powerful learning is you can have all the pieces in place, but if there's no community buy-in, if they don't see the value of it, a lot of our schools struggled because people saw that these, techno these devices, Chromebooks, iPads were going out, but like, they saw it as a stopgap for the pandemic, the crisis. And when the crisis was over, they kind of expected them to be drawn back in. And they kind of had to like, take a moment and catch on that this is the reality going forward. So what we see is if you have an intentionality about not just what they're going to do, but which tools you're going to invest in and take the time to put in front of people, right? It can't just be like, here, take all of this and randomly use it and we'll learn from you only. I think there's a lot of power in that. Like that's my place in school when I was a teacher, right? Um, to like bubble up practices. But you have to have a sense of what that is. For me, I think some of the best places that I've seen, the best examples, are places that have focused on student voice, storytelling, where they're going to get a, to be like, and that, that embraces a lot of the equity uh, of, of hearing different stories of learning, right? How can an individual story about how they learned and what they experienced be put out into the world in a way that makes them feel like powerful and feel like they matter and they're important, but also in a way that teaches them the skills that they need to just go out and um, find a place in this world? Yep. No, it's great. It's great. And I think. Um you know, that intentionality is really important and how to do that well. I'll just put a little plug. Digital Promise has this amazing ed tech pilot framework that I think we undersell. Like, <laughs> and it's actually got for both, we designed it for districts, how to pilot an ed tech product well, but actually ed tech product developers use it for how to, what to design for. Like this is what you should be able to do to do an effective and thoughtful pilot that is intentional around integrating a product into your district. So David, you, we talked about, um, uh, you know, transformational experience you had in your career when you started really stepping into this and flipping to sort of student empowerment. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and why that really matters so much? Yeah, thank you. So this is my fourth district rolling out one-to-one, -one, twice as principal and twice as a central office for the whole district. And so in the fourth rendition, we got good, good with intentionality and vision and, and curriculum and modern tools. I want to tell the story about 2004 I worked for a visionary superintendent who went on a trip to North Carolina at the Mooresville Graded School District. I think it was funded by Apple and George Lucas Foundation. He came back and he said, we need a couple schools to go one-to-one. -one. And this is 2004. And so, new principal, please the superintendent. Yeah, I'll do it. So I had 100% Title I school, all English learners, and the other school was a very affluent school in Fullerton. And so all of our kids got devices at the same time. There were these multicolored clamshell Apple computers. Anybody remember the multicolored clamshell? They hardly did anything, right? Internet was not even a thing yet, right? You could find it hardly one, two, three on search. But the kids in my schools went to GarageBand, Keynote, and Numbers, and all these tools that I'd never even heard of, and they started making stuff. They made podcasts, they made music, and the kids in the affluent schools we're waiting to be told what to do. Uh, what, is, what, is it, what does an A look like? What am I supposed to do? And our kids in the 100% Title I school, free and reduced lunch, just went to town and outperformed these kids and it changed the way our teachers looked at our students. They're brilliant, yeah. they're genius, and they taught our teachers how to use technology in the classroom and those lessons have helped, led, helped us lead intentionality and creativity in addition to the blended and personalized learning. It's amazing, and I think it really shows. It's, it, I think the key is, you know, we, we have these challenges in our education system, and so many times we feel like it's pulling a boulder up a hill, right? It's just so, so hard, and we're trying to, but really if you flip it, then you almost have the opportunity to be running down the hill in front of the kids just to make sure that they go where they want, right? And that's, that's a lot easier and a lot more scalable. <laughs> right? So it's great, so Kyla, Learner Variability Project. We hear about learning sciences, learner variability, um, and the potential when you have rich technology to, to really unlock and support that in the classroom. Can you talk about kind of why that matters and give us an example? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love that example already. I think it ties in well. So, so learner variability is this idea that learners vary not just in what they know, but in how they learn best. And by understanding and broadening our, our understanding of how students learn, not just in their academic domains, but in their, their own backgrounds, their home environments, in their cognition and their social emotional learning, 
we can really harness powerful learning through technology and educators. Now, to give you an example, at Digital Promise, we've created some tools like the Learner Variability Navigator that's a free open source rep, web app to basically take all of this different research on how learners vary and how it matters for their learning, distill that down into several different you know, factors and strategies within each of these domains of students' backgrounds, of their social emotional learning and cognition, and their, of course, the academic domains, and really be able to help ed tech products, educators, whoever wants to use that in their own practices to create more evidence-based uh, supports, essentially, for all learners, not just this mythical average. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. Um, in one partnership, uh, we worked with ReadWorks, a nonprofit uh, learning platform to help improve literacy. And we looked at, based off of their goals for the products, how we might instill some of these more evidence-based practices to, to add to their existing features. So for instance, these were things like uh, text-to-speech or audiobook options for students, which research has shown in the past can help English language learners and students with reading disabilities. Or uh, other features included split screens or uh, you know, bands that help students focus on a particular line of text or being able to change the text uh, magnification, which again has been shown to be helpful to some students with dyslexia and younger students who might need to see bigger words. And these simple changes that were designed for particular groups of students with particular strengths and challenges actually turned out to benefit all students. So when we followed up with students uh, in a particular district and teachers in that district and looked at their usage and looked at their standardized test scores um, based in literacy, we found that students who used these features that we had developed through learning science and learner variability actually engaged more in the platform and they improved their, their test scores and performance. And what's so interesting about that is it's an example of how designing at the margins, you could call it targeted universalism, the curb cut effect, there's lots of names for it, but really instead of focusing on this idea that all students learn the same, you can look at the students who may be most marginalized in a particular context and design for them and design with them. And that can create better learning experiences for everyone. And what's so important about that in the pandemic especially is that we're seeing this entirely new understanding of students' home environments, their personal backgrounds, their social emotional learning, and getting a much more intensive uh, agreement that those factors are so clearly critical for academic outcomes, among other things. And at that sort of window into their home lives, that window into you know, how much sleep they get, how they deal with metacognitive issues, is all part of the learning process. And when you design for it, then you can really enhance learning much more so than if you're just focusing on common personalization or differentiation strategies like ability grouping. That's great. And I think, um, yeah, I remember one example, another example of that is we're working with a district and uh, a learner was struggling in decoding um, and they were talking to the parent actually uh, about it and the parent said, saw this map of all these factors and saw emotion and anxiety and was like, oh, I never thought about emotion and anxiety as mattering in learning to read. I notice when I sit down to read with my daughter, she suddenly gets tense and starts stuttering and, and gets super anxious. And so suddenly you saw how actually this outside effect was actually impacting her academics inside. And, um, and that's where these abilities to personalize for the whole learner really make an impact. And so Quentin, Remind, one of the biggest engagement platforms out there for students, teachers, families. Can you talk a little bit about really what you saw during the pandemic and what you see as sort of yep. the big, um, kind of the big stories coming out of that, the big yeah. impacts? Um, yeah, so, you know, for those who don't know, Remind connects, you know, over two million teachers, tens of millions of students, parents, 
um, on a communication platform. We've got classroom messaging, whole school and whole district messaging, uh, and now a remote tutoring service that you can sign up for either as a school or as a parent. Um, and you know, I think the heart of Remind, the thing that we're that we are really focused on, is supporting all of these amazing sort of learning experiences. But we're we're we sort of believe that the engine driving all of this is the the real relationship that gets formed between the teacher, the student, and the family. Um, that relationship, I think, you know, we all in, intuitively know is so important. Like if we think back about what made us most successful in school, we often remember a teacher that challenged us or opened up a whole new area of interest for us or really made us feel taken care of. Um, and, you know, remind in some small way is just trying to break down barriers so that every, every student can get access to those relationships, um, whether those barriers are, you know, language or time or distance what you know whatever is keeping it keeping those relationships from forming um, obviously covid was a tremendous barrier to those relationships all of a sudden you have you know millions of students that literally fall off the map right they they don't come to school you can't reach them anymore um, and that's where you know in some ways i like to talk about remind is like actually a very low tech tech company because we really focus on as broad access as possible. It's so important that every family can actually be reached um, to build these relationships with their educators. Um, that's why SMS is still incredibly important for us. Um, of course, we have people that use the apps and the website as well, but the SMS is a huge you know, common ground for, for a lot of people. Uh, and we've had a lot of teachers and, and educators write to us during the pandemic and say, you know, SMS was the lifeline through which I was able to keep in touch with with, with these students. So, you know, as they rotated in classroom and out of classroom, remote learning, uh, in-person learning, hybrid learning, um, it was sort of the, the throughput, the, the, the consistent channel that they were able to use the whole time. So, um, so that's what we try to do in our small way. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. And I think that that connection is so powerful. I think one thing I'm always blown away, there's this strategy uh, that's been well-researched. It's called the two in 10. And basically, there's been many randomized control trials done that if a teacher sits down with a kid for two minutes a day, 10 days in a row, and just asks, how you doing? And just listens for two minutes. It actually has a statistically significant impact on test scores. It's that powerful. Just having that connection is, is critical and really helps learners step into that. Yeah. I, th I think that's like exactly what Remind is trying to do. And I think the other thing that we've really seen during the pandemic is it's accelerated the way that school districts think about uh, what they what they can do and what they should do for students who have unfinished learning. Um, I think that there's a we're seeing an acceleration across many many states of funding and and directives getting poured into uh, actual tutoring programs um, that facilitate those real high throughput relationships uh, in a high dosage tutoring manner. Um, and and we think that this is sort of the start of a, a, a big expansion in schools. Uh, understanding of how tutoring should fold into their their yep. curriculum and their programming. Can I fanboy for a second off of yep. that? So very early on when I got my first one-to-one -one program where I promised my superintendent I was going to like change the world with iPads and I'd never held one, right? Like I was like, I, the, the thing that won over the district to go fully one-to-one -one was in our pilot, I had incorporated, Remind had been built into Schoology and that was it for me, like I could communicate. And um, the superintendent was really impressed that when he asked the parents who were part of that one-to-one -one how it went, they all knew what was going on, mm. right? So you had this incorporation, so those strong relationships, but it also made those parents part of it. And for me, when I heard that you were on this panel, I was like, yeah, that was the thing. That did it for me. <laughs> That's great. So let, let me ask a question. We'll go David and then, uh, and then Darren. Is, um, so tutoring is is a big trend right now and people are trying to look in whether it's to help accelerate learning fill in gaps and take advantage of this opportunity to integrate that into our practice uh, as you look forward what what do you hope to see from tutoring supports uh, to really put equity at the center what what are you hoping really can bring that in and ground that what would you look for whether it's products or supports or opportunities to collaborate to bring that into your district well, there's, there's science and research to, to support, and I know that Quentin will appreciate that 
the number one factor in impact of tutoring is relationship. Mm -hmm. And so we studied, you know, hours tutoring versus hours tutoring with a person I know versus hours tutoring with someone I believe cares about me. Mm -hmm. And the cares about me matters more than anything else. Wow. Even if it's just someone sitting there asking them to work harder, yep. not necessarily teaching them to do anything more. So I think when we introduced one-to-one -one in our district, we talked to parents about if we do it right, it's less tech, more human. Mm -hmm. If the technology is used right, it's like in healthcare. Mm -hmm. The healthcare does the blocking and tackling for the doctors and nurses to see data visibly, to be more efficient with analysis, but the bedside manner and the, the way that you interact with a patient becomes the focus. Yep. So I think if we do this right, the focus will be on relationships, communication, and trust. And for me, we, we invested quite a bit of money in tutoring uh, once the pandemic hit and continued uh, throughout this year. We will not renew that contract for the following year. And one of the things that we've learned is that tutoring programs that focus primarily on a, a text texting methodology where, you know, the tutor is chatting in a box with the kid, not very effective at all. The relationship does not get established. So it needs to be uh, more, uh, more focused on the students in terms of a more interactive process where the student can actually see who they're interacting with and develop a relationship uh, with that individual. And we, we will not be investing in any more tutoring programs that are just text-based and you know, send in the question, response comes back, and and no relationship is developed with the, with the individuals they're interacting with, not successful at all. So there's a theme here around connection. So Kyla, how would you layer learner variability into that, maybe? Yeah, well, I was just thinking part of what makes tutoring so powerful, it has you know, some of the biggest, most consistent effect sizes across literature reviews and is now suddenly becoming such a popular topic is because it is integrating the academic with the social, emotional, with the cognitive, with students' backgrounds, because introducing, you know, I've seen more uh, ed tech products, I've worked on them, I've funded them in the past couple years around relationship building, around social, emotional learning, than I've seen for, you know, the decade before this. And I think part of that is so exciting to me because we are understanding the importance and we're trying to figure out tools to do that. But I think in the coming years, we're going to need to really figure out how to do what often really good tutoring does, which is integrate the academic with the social emotional, with relationships, and be able to create those personalized learning experiences that take that whole person into account in an academic context. And so as we develop more and more tools that can work on different pieces of, of how students learn, we need to be able to see that whole picture of, of who that student is as a person rather than individual slices and reduce the sort of noise of having so many different products to choose from and use for each different need of a given student. So I'm, I'm really excited to see more solutions like high dosage tutoring that can integrate all of the elements of who a student is. Now, I don't want to take over your role, but I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to transition into data interoperability. Ah, that's a big one. So let me just share one quick anecdote, and then we'll go there. The, uh, so one anecdote is that Digital Promise, we recently launched a product certification around learner variability. So do products have supports for social, emotional learning, cognitive aspects, and diverse backgrounds? and they can apply, and if they provide evidence, they can get certified. And what was interesting was when we were piloting this, um, there was a math product that actually applied, and part of it is there was a requirement for some social-emotional supports, and they came back and said to us, why are you making us do social-emotional supports when we're a math product? <laughs> and I think, I was like, that's exactly the conversation we need to have. Like, math is a social-emotional process, and you need to integrate if you really want kids to, to accelerate, as we hope. And so as we get into uh, all of these applications and apps, I will say uh, my, my former boss, Karen Cater, who some of you may know, we were chatting uh, before she left and we kind of reflecting, we said the last 10 years was so much about how do we get teachers to use technology? How do we get them to use it? How do we get them to use it? Now they're all using it, right? 
And I feel like the next decade is about how do we integrate it, right? How do they, they're being bombarded with a thousand apps. How do I, what fits my pedagogy, my kids, my context, all this, and how to do that, that's not easy. But a core part of that is actually data interoperability. Um, and so can you help me uh, tell us how you think about that and what you look for uh, when you're looking for partners to work with. Yeah, so think, think of it this way. Uh, most of us, well, any of us in education, there's, there's a plethora of tools out there right now to use, right? Tons of apps, tons of software to use, tons of reports. But what we're looking for now is how do we aggregate all of that stuff into more like a multiple measures report, right? Instead of the teacher accessing this system, that system, this system, et cetera. How do we pull all that data together? Whether it's SEL, whether it's uh, academically related, how do we pull all that data together to get a, a complete profile of the students that we're serving so that we can better meet their needs? And, and that, in a nutshell, is what data interoperability is all about. And at this point in time, uh, we're really focused on how do we make the vendors understand that, that what they're creating has to be more interactive for the end users and, and can't just be the, the set reports that they want that are incapable of being uploaded, so we have to load it into something else to try and make sense out of it and create our own reports. We want to be able to pull that data into a system that will aggregate it with, with all the other systems that we're using. I have an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, so we developed a curriculum called the World of Work. It's a K-12 career development curriculum that our board invested two and a half million dollars in uh, to teach our kids how to live and how to make a living. It, in it incorporates financial empowerment, social emotional learning, relationship skills, all on a path to gainful employment. Three years ago, here at ASU GSB, we were exhibiting our curriculum, and we're doing that now at this conference, too. You can go out and see World of Work out there. And I ran into Saki Dodelson, the former CEO of Chief 3000, and she sold it. I said, Saki, what are you going to do? She said, I want to build something new. And I, she said, literacy. I said, well, how about literacy, career development, social emotional learning, financial empowerment? So over the last three years, we built our modern curriculum into the best-in-class tool for literacy and Lexile growth called Beable. And we're excited to say that we have some data in our ability. Be happy to show it to you. <laughs> That's great. That's great. No, but listen to what he said. He said some data interoperability, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Quentin, as a, as a product, uh, how do you guys approach and think about interoperability with platforms and yeah. prioritizing that for districts and schools? So, so we definitely think of ourselves as a platform, and there's a, there's a number of different sort of integration points from the way teachers use their mind in the classroom, making it really easy for them to share content from, con from other like curriculum and, and assessment services into Remind. Um, there's also the way administrators use Remind to send out data from uh, important services, so sending out lunch money balances or report cards or attendance notices. Um, and then I think the, the one that you were sort of talking about is more for analytics purposes. How do you know what the students are doing? How do you know how the tools are being used? Um, and so we have, we have a number of different ways that we allow administrators to access data in our UI, download it via our API, um, get access to sort of full message history of anyone in their communities. Um, a, a real challenge I will say is uh, just the, f the fragmentation of the, of the market of, and not just fragmentation of the market, but you know, the way a large district interacts with data is very different than the way like a three school district interacts with data. Um, they're, the way that they um, think about problems, the, the resources they have available to them to analyze problems, um, even you know, things like you know, extracting data from a database, like you know, different districts have different ability to do that regularly. Um, and so we're always trying to build uh, build products for a couple of different sort of ideal customers. Um, some that are that really want just like raw API access, and some that just want sort of a dashboard that they can look at, you know, once a week or something. Yeah, that's right. Some districts have research teams and data analysts, and others don't at all, right? Yeah. And it's it's a pretty wide range. Um, Sean, as you've rolled out in um, Verizon Innovative Learning Schools, when you've worked with ed tech products and in the context of powerful learning. 
How, what are some of the things you think about in terms of coherence, kind of bringing it together, uh, both from implementation but then application? As the availability of technology is out there, and as more and more schools have it, um, I think I see people a little overwhelmed, like leadership in schools, a little overwhelmed by, yes, this tool can give me data, but I have to be in X portal, and I have to be in this portal. And how many portals can we realistically expect a leader to be in to gather all that data? And how much aggregating of that can they do, right? So, um, like, we have this idea. We try to build dashboards that kind of combine all of that data. And if you have a tool and we can't put it into that, like, your data becomes not as meaningful to us, right? So making that data meaningful so that people aren't swimming. I think the other thing is decision-making about technology amongst uh, leadership in schools is really challenging because when it was a few tools coming into schools and uh, each leader had the time to like dive in and really see like what can this do, is this gonna lead to value? Um, now we have so many that the decision-making time, like you have to make really hard decisions about what a tool could do. One example, does this tool provide the privacy that I need for all of that data. So how does a superintendent know that your product provides the privacy that they need? Like that's the first threshold. If you don't, we're not even gonna look at the other things that that technology does, right? So um, if there were a way, so there's, there's, through Digital Promise, we have a program for product certifications. And one of them is that you can check on like pr data privacy. And through that, if you could provide a way for leadership to look into an, uh, a tool and say, how can I check boxes from a, a meaningful source? Like the industry can't do that because industry is gonna say, it, it's gonna be like, I don't wanna say it's not gonna be honest, but it's going to lean towards its, what's in its best interest. But where um, I think uh, nonprofits can do something is to say, here is this product and we can guarantee for you through these standards that you can easily learn about that it meets this standard, that it checks this box. So how could we help leadership more quickly adopt the tools that are going to be meaningfully applied in an intentional way to what it is that we want to do, right? And, it, and it's great that you can build one, right? Like in your situation, you build one, but when we, we can't scale that to have everybody build a custom product, how do we make it so that they can customize what exists to meet their needs quickly and uh, a decision that supports them in not taking risks with a product that's not going to do that? Yep. No, that's great. So we're in the last stretch here. Uh, just to sort of wrap up, let's say we're five years out. We come back here, we're back on stage in five years. Uh, real quick, just one or two lines. Let's think of the learners. Let's put them at the center. What do you hope, uh, how do you hope your learners are engaging with technology? What's different uh, that's really making a difference in their lives? What do you think will change? What do you hope to change kind of in the field of ed tech? For me, it would be them being at the center of, of creating. Um, regardless of what the tool is and in the area of technology, they need to be at the center of creativity and creating uh, from the products that they use. Um, the days of Sage on the stage, they're long gone. And our students are, are very talented. The only thing lacking is opportunity, and we have to provide the opportunity for them to access that technology so they can show us what they're capable of creating. Um, for me, it's that we're creating products that uniquely express a student identity in a meaningful way about something that's important to them, right? Um, it's, it's like an overused phrase, but no one has ever said, wow, that worksheet changed my life. Yep. <laughs> but I have students from 10 years ago who regularly check in with me to see if their video has now gone over the next 100,000 views. Yep. And that has changed their life. And it's meant something to them. It's given them voice and power. Like, I have a student, if you... If you Google Adam Smith versus Karl Marx, their video that they made, instead of a Venn diagram, is going to come up number one, cool. right? And that, yeah. I think, if we look back at what they've done and we see like the story of their growth as a human and not like a trail of papers that they completed, that, that'll be success for me. Yep, that's great. Our learner profile already has the, the strengths, interests, and values of our kids, but what's missing is verified skills and credentials that could exist on the blockchain that they could own and they could take anywhere and actually use that as currency in the world of work. Yep. That That'd exists be, already, we're just power. not using it in the United States at scale yet. Yep, that's right. Kyla? I think 
being able to see these big challenges that we've faced for decades, like opportunity gaps, not as a student problem or a teacher problem or a parent problem, but as a design challenge and being able to integrate all of those players into, as Darren said, how we solve those design challenges. Uh, I would say, I just hope that every student, uh, no, that no student is denied the ability to form a really formational and foundational relationship uh, because they don't have access to it physically. Um, because their school uh, doesn't have a full suite of AP courses or doesn't have a you know in-person tutoring program or their parents can't cart them to Kumon or Sylvan twice a week after school. Like Just because you can't be there physically doesn't mean that you shouldn't build those really foundational relationships. All right, fantastic. Well, redesigning for powerful learning. Thank you to all the panelists. It was wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>